In this video, I'm going to give an explanation and a hands-on example on how to add an API controller to a .NET C Sharp Razor project. So first of all, what is a controller? Well, it's part of the well-known model view controller UI framework where the view is what the user sees, kind of like an HTML document or something like that. The model represents the data that's pushed into that view. And then the controller will handle things like button presses or any kind of UI logic or anything like that. These th three things all work closely together. Now, the view doesn't necessarily have to be something the user can see. Uh, it could be something that a machine, in other words, another computer can see. And in that case, it would be something like a RESTful JSON endpoint, which is the example that I'm going to use in this demonstration. So uh, controller, in our case, is going to contain API endpoints. And we're going to need to do a bit of mapping in our program CS, which I'll show just a moment in this video. Uh, so we also need to create a data class that's going to emit some JSON logic. I created that in a previous video. It's one called specimen that represents a specific plant planted at a specific location. Then we need to define our controller with the API controller annotation. We'll find out we get that for free when we create the controller in Visual Studio, which I'll do in just a moment. And then we'll need to edit our program.cs to tell our program where to find the controller and our API endpoints. A good way to make a controller is to simply start in Solution Explorer up at the root of our project. And let's go ahead and make a new folder because we might have multiple controllers. This folder is often called controller. Uh, I call mine controllers uh, because there's actually a class called controller and it can get confused on what's what. Now within this controller, I'm going to say controller folder. I'm going to say add and then we'll say controller. I'll choose API and I'll say API controller with uh, read write actions. And we'll go ahead and use the default name values controller. And what we'll see is that we have our values controller, which extends controller base. And then it has a get, which returns a, an enumerable or a collection of strings. And then it has get that takes an ID. It has a post, a put, and a delete method. These all match up to the HTTP actions, which form the framework for RESTful JSON services and part of what makes them so simple. Once we've created our controller, we simply need to let our program know that it exists. And we do that through this program CS file, which is basically configuration for our project. So I look for this builder variable up towards the top, and I see because I'm in a Razor, Razor project, it's adding Razor pages essentially as a dependency. So I simply need to add a couple things here. Builder services add controllers, and builder services add endpoints API Explorer. Since we're going to be use the, using this for RESTful JSON services available via an endpoint, in other words, a URI, I also need to, need to add a mapping to this controller. So down towards the app here, we'll say app, map controller route, open paren, close paren, terminate with semicolon, then inside of those. We'll see that we give it a name, in this case default, and then a pattern. Now a pattern is kind of like a URL pattern, which is important when we're looking at API endpoints because typically it's going to be a domain name and then an endpoint name, maybe some action we're going to call, and then maybe some record number. And we effectively see that enumerated here. So what's the controller we're calling first? Because there could be multiple controllers. So there will be something like uh, for uh, values controller, we'll put in the word values there. And then next is, okay, what are we calling? Are we calling an index? Are we calling a get, a post, a put? What's the HTTP action we're calling? And then optionally, some of those HTTP actions require a unique identifier. For example, uh, post, because, or sorry, uh, put actually, because put is saying, take what's here and update it with this, or delete. Uh, delete also is going to require an identifier because we want to say delete this record. Now we'll typically have multiple flavors of get. One get without any kind of identifier will typically return all records, where get with an identifier will return that specific record. So that's the pattern that we see enumerated there. With this now, we can go ahead and start our app up and look at the controller via its endpoints. Out of the box, we get this controller that simply 
is dealing with strings. Now, one note is that if you find you have methods that are returning strings a lot, you're probably not doing a really good job of object-oriented design. It's better to return an actual object, uh, something that's an object of a class that you created like a data class. So I'm going to switch all of these strings to specimens. Now I've changed the signatures. And let's go ahead and import specimen here uh, from my plant diary. And now you notice that we can't return a string if the return type is specimen. So uh, let me go ahead and put in a bit of static, or in other words, hard-coded data. So you notice in the get endpoint that's returning everything, I've simply created two different specimen objects. I've added them to an iList variable called specimens. And then I'm returning that specimens. That matches with the return type above, even though that's iEnumerable and this is iList. Both are interfaces, and iList extends from iEnumerable. So using the Liskov substitution principle of the solid design patterns, we know that a, a subtype can be substituted for its supertype because the subtype is guaranteed to have all those methods. So that works out great. Uh, also, we have a get endpoint that's just returning one item, and I just put Paul Paul in there, and I'm returning that. Notice, once again, I'm actually creating a an object of the specimen type, and I'm returning that specimen type. Uh, under the covers, the, the uh, .NET framework is going to convert this to a JSON string that we'll be able to see at our endpoint. Now, the other endpoints like post and put uh, and delete, so post and put accept a value. I've changed that to specimen, but right now those are just empty methods. I'm not actually doing doing anything with those uh, because I'm using a read-only data source. But in just a moment, I'll put a breakpoint line in there so that we can actually watch these work. I deploy my application and note when I go to the default get endpoint, it returns to me an array with the two specimens that I created earlier, Eastern Redbud and also Paw Paw. Remember that this is the endpoint that returns the entire collection, but we can also request a specific item simply by putting in a slash and then a number. And once again, this is hard-coded at the moment, but you notice it just returns one item, not an array. If it were an array, we'd see square brackets on the open and close, but there are no square brackets. We simply see one set of curly brackets, which indicates this is a single item, and it happens to be that Paul Paul Asimna Triloba that I put in for that single item. Static data is great for testing and proof of concept, but really a controller should be working with data that's available elsewhere in the application. The best way to do this is through some kind of persistence mechanism, like a database or some way where we're writing data to disk that can be retrieved elsewhere. But for simplicity and for time's sake, I'm not going to use a persistence mechanism. Instead, I'm simply going to pass data through our application in memory. I can use a static class to do this. So with a static class or a static attribute on a class, we set that value, and that value applies for all objects that are created of that class. And it just happens to be an efficient way to pass data from, in our case, our index.cshtml down to our controller. Our index.cshtml page, if you remember, is finding the specimens of plants at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden that tend to be thirsty ones that need water. So that will give us a list of about 167 plants. So let's take a look at creating the static class. In Solution Explorer, I right click on my project and I choose Add, New Item, just Normal Class. We'll call it Specimen Roster. Now to make it static, we just need a few changes. First of all, we'll add the keyword static. Now inside of here, uh, the constructor is going to be a bit interesting because really it's a static constructor and it's meant to initialize static variables. Notice very similar to a normal constructor, only it has that keyword static inside of it. Now let's go ahead and declare a static variable that this constructor will be able to instantiate. And import my plant diary. So now if you look at this line, you'll notice that we have public access, but with a getter and setter. And then once again, we're using that static keyword where remember static means there's only one value no matter how many objects we create. So an instance variable would be different for each object potentially, where static variable means every object gets the same value. Uh, so we have that static and then we say that we're going to have some type of list and that's an interface that contains specimen types and we're going to name it all specimens. So up here in our constructor, 
uh, we can simply say all specimens. We can simply construct it like so by creating a new list of specimen objects and putting that into the variable. This static initialization block will only be invoked once, so we only need to worry about that getting called one time. Let's navigate to our index code behind. And this will be fairly easy to populate because if you recall how our index page works, and again, that's the page that shows the thirsty plant specimens at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. What it does is it starts with all of the specimens at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, and then it filters down by only those that have water needs. And that's what it's showing to the user via this result variable. So that result variable is of what type? Well, it's a list of specimens, and hopefully that sounds fairly familiar uh, because that's the very same type that we just created in our specimen roster. So really saving this to the specimen roster is easy. And now we can use this in our controller. So the git should return everything, so that's an easy one. We're gonna take out all this hard-coded stuff that we added earlier. And simply return specimen roster all specimens, easy as that. Git's going to be a little more interesting here uh, because we're not returning all specimens, but instead we're returning just one. But once again, we can take out the hard-coded stuff here. Once again, this return statement becomes ridiculously easy because remember, we're receiving the ID that we want to show to the user. And all we have to do is take that ID and pass that into the collection of all specimens that we are getting from our index page and storing in our static variable and return that specific item. Let's take a look. We see that our home page appears with uh, several specimens and latitude, longitude, so on and so forth. And then I can hit our API endpoint. And you notice when I hit that, just that big API endpoint, it, it returns us back a fairly good list of specimens. And I realize now it's less than 167. I believe 167 was available at the zoo, and then we filtered it down to a smaller list. But nonetheless, you see that it is indeed a collection of specimens. You see the start square bracket and the close square bracket. And then each individual specimen is rep represented by an open close curly and comma separated. Now, take a look at one of these. Zero, one, two, and three is a cumulus service, vari uh, service berry, uh, amelanchier. So that's our third element if we start counting at zero. Now, what happens if I try that endpoint where I say, just give me the element at item number three? And sure enough, you see cumulus service berry, amelanchier. And of course, because we're using live data here, we can actually look at element number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we can validate that we're getting the correct element in each of those cases. So this video has been a look at how to create a controller that gives us RESTful JSON API endpoints. It could be any type of endpoint really, but in this case it was a RESTful JSON API endpoint. As always, I hope this video was helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Uh, in our next video, I'm going to show how to engage Swagger documentation to this API endpoint, which gives us a nice user interface that describes the endpoints that are available to us. And it also allows us to test out those endpoints with a nice looking user interface. Thank you.